All right, and we're live. Um, so I'm just going to go over, check the chat here, make sure everything is working. And it looks like the stream with Gary Gensler is about to start in two minutes or so. All right, it looks like people are coming in. Can everyone hear everything perfectly and everything sounds good? I don't think the stream has audio yet, but as long as you can hear me, we should be good. Looks good. Thanks, Chris Paulson. So does anyone think today is going to have an impact on the markets? I think everything is probably priced in at this point, but we'll see. Loud and clear. All right. Thanks, everyone. Let's see if anyone's talking in the Discord here. Do you guys think I should have a, a price chart of Bitcoin up uh, right next to the stream, or is that overkill? Yeah, Ben thinks it's priced in as well. Uh, JL's asking about the curve token. Um, <laughs> we can talk about that later. I'm just going to focus on the regulations. Uh, Steven, I did not get Gary to talk. I am just streaming the Washington Post live stream here. So we're just going to watch it together and then discuss it after and perhaps, you know, have a few comments as we go through it. People want the chart on. All right, let's see if I can do that. Uh, Coinbase Pro. Can I do multiple tabs? Let's see. Uh, I don't think I can do multiple tabs. Sorry, guys. All right, it looks like the stream is starting in 20 seconds. Yeah, sorry, guys. I can't get the chart on. I see. I think the comments are all delayed in the chat. Um, so sorry about that. Maybe I'll pull it up on my phone, and I'll, I'll show you guys if anything happens. All right. Yeah, we can take questions after. All right, looks like we're starting. Here we go. So it looks like there's some type of dramatic video leading up to it. It's kind of lame. Just while we're waiting for Gary to come on, you guys can all hear the video feed, right? Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today in our continuing series, The Path Forward, we're joined by Gary Gensler, chair of the Securities Exchange Commission. Last week before the Senate Banking Committee, Chair Gensler talked about the need to regulate cryptocurrency, the issue that's fascinating financial markets. We're hoping to continue that conversation today with Chair Gensler. Welcome to Washington Post Live. Good to be with you, David. Good to be with all of you in the audience. So let's uh, start with the latest uh, significant uh, blip uh, in the cryptocurrency world, and that's the dramatic uh, drop in the value of, of Bitcoin and other uh, uh, tokens <laughs> last night, uh, down 8%. I'm going to ask you what uh, that experience uh, told you about the basic issue of cryptos uh, stability as an asset uh, and the need for some greater regulation. So um, crypto tokens, what you've promoted in this program called cryptocurrencies, even though some of my colleagues in the official sector shy away from that term, I, I'm, I'm comfortable using it, are a highly speculative asset class. Uh, I started and was honored to research this and study it and teach it at MIT. And, and work with the computer science colleagues. And I think there are innovations in that basic uh, 
white paper, so to speak, that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto put out about a dozen years ago. And whomever she, he, or they were, we still don't know, had some basic innovations. But what we have now is an asset class that's highly speculative, stored on a digital ledger, and um, uh, the values, as you said yesterday, went down, but they could go down dramatically, they could go up dramatically, uh, and in often cases, there's uh, not something standing behind it other than what somebody else will pay you for it. Before we get into the details of what might be involved in regulation, I want to ask you about the underlying um, economic news that seemed to drive the movement in, in, uh, in Bitcoin and these other uh, currencies uh, overnight. And, and that is concern about the highly leveraged Chinese uh, real estate sector and the overhang in financial markets. And I just want to ask you as SEC chairman, whether you have concerns about the possibility of contagion in U.S. and international financial markets as a result of what's going on in China and what steps you've been taking recently to, to try to protect our markets uh, uh, and our st uh, financial stability in this situation. Look, we're a highly interconnected uh, uh, global economy. The U.S., only about 4% of the world's people were 23 or 4% of the economy, but 38% of the world's capital markets. So we have an outsized uh, representation, but it's highly interconnected. Now, as it relates to China, we've been doing a number of things. We have about 270 China-related companies raising money here in the U.S. Uh, we put a pause on uh, new companies issuing in the U.S. Uh, until we can enhance the disclosure. We have a basic bargain in the United States, it's been around for about 90 years since the Great Depression. Investors get to decide whether you invest, but the issuer has to give you full and fair uh, disclosure, and we protect against fraud and the like in the, and manipulation in the markets. That's one of my worries about crypto and the crypto asset class. But back to China, uh, given some of the changes in the uh, regulatory and political climate in China, uh, we've uh, asked issuers to put greater emphasis on the disclosure that usually all you're buying is a Cayman Islands company that has some legal arrangements with an operating company in uh, China. And you don't actually own directly those Chinese companies. A second thing happening is is about 19 years ago, there was another basic bargain that we set up an organization here in the United States to look at the auditing of the public companies. And it's about trust in our capital markets that you have somebody, it's called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, uh, that looks at the auditors to ensure that the numbers are accurate. Uh, and what do we find 19 years later, 50 or so jurisdictions have allowed that, but two have not, and that's Hong Kong and China. And so Congress weighed in unanimously in the Senate, and it was taken up by the House and weighed in. And we're supposed to uh, uh, basically solve this in the next three years, meaning China needs to comply, their official sector and auditors need to comply or we're going to be uh, uh, suspending trading for those 270 companies. And let me just ask one more uh, question on, on this. Uh, given the ex extraordinary uh, debt uh, pressure on Evergrande, a very large uh, Chinese real estate development company, some uh, analysts have worried that there could be a, a contagion uh, in financial markets, like what we remember from 2008 and the, the failure of Lehman, Lehman Brothers and, and, and associated derivatives, swaps that would be uh, impacted by the, the failure of a very large international player like this. So I just want to be uh, clear in asking you, do, are you confident that our financial markets today are protected in the event that there was such a failure, not necessarily with this company, but any large uh, uh, company with that level of debt anywhere? Well, uh, David, it's a great question. It's multi-layered, some of which I, I hope you'd understand. I don't want to comment on one company, and particularly this one company that you mentioned isn't registered and uh, traded directly on you know, our uh, capital markets. It's registered in Hong Kong, it operates in, 
in China. But it is accurate to say that we're a highly interconnected uh, global economic system. And just as the U.S. Uh, propagated uh, a bit of a crisis from our housing bubble in 2008, and others around the globe uh, reacted to those shocks, it is possible from time to time that we too in America will react to other economies and nations' shocks. And particularly China's economy is so large relative to Europe's or, or our own. To your second question, I do think that the reforms after the 2008 crisis stood up a much stronger U.S. financial system. It doesn't mean that there aren't issues uh, that uh, we look at at the SEC and the other important federal regulators like the Federal Reserve and the bank regulators and the CFTC that I once was honored to chair. But I do think that we're in better position in 2021 to absorb some of those shocks than we were uh, prior to the 08 crisis. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, we're isolated. Our economies are connected around the globe. Let's come back to, uh, to crypto issues. You used some very strong language recently in both speeches and testimony referring to crypto. And well, I'm David, quoting here. David, if I might, I, I like to speak clearly if I can. And I, <laughs> I, do, I, do, think, I, do, I do think this new technology is a very interesting and uh, whomever she was, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, there's, it's led to, to change. It's, it's pushing at the side of central banks around the globe to reconsider how to provide payment systems. It's pushing on the side as a catalyst for change in uh, finance, so-called fintech, the intersection of new technologies and finance. Um, I, I, I taught this and studied it for several years at MIT and, and, and really uh, uh, wouldn't have dedicated my time to it if I didn't think it was interesting and innovative. But at the same time, I don't think technologies long last outside of a social and public policy framework. And in this case, uh, we have to ensure for investor and consumer protection, that's what an agency like ours, the SEC does, but also ensure other public policy goals, that people are compliant with taxes and compliant with what's called anti-money laundering and, and the like, and that we don't undermine the stability of the system. So um, uh, I think it's better to bring it inside the uh, public policy framework uh, and, uh, and ensure that we uh, address these important public policy goals. But I'm sorry I interrupted you about this strong words that you were saying I had said. Oh, oh, I, uh, that's, that's not a bad uh, uh, phrase in, in, in my book. So let's get into the, the details of this. In, in your testimony, you said if we don't address these issues with, uh, with cryptocurrencies, I worry that a lot of people will get hurt. You said in your testimony last week uh, that the SEC already has authority it needs to regulate uh, crypto. But then, as I read your testimony, you also talked about wanting more authority to do that more properly. So uh, tell us what uh, you can do now with the authority you have and what you'd like to do additionally uh, in, in areas that you're not now able to regulate. Should be interesting. So um, the SEC stood up in the 1930s got a very broad remit to cover securities. And Congress decided to, to write this definition broadly, included 30 or 35 subparts to it. And then, uh, of course, this sometimes gets challenged in the court, the Supreme Courts. But as Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall wrote in an opinion about this definition of security back in 1990, the Congress painted with a broad brush. And the reason was to protect investors against fraud. In, and in the world of finance, uh, uh, you know, it's human nature that people come along and they try to sell something and, and exaggerate or, or the, you know, the classic sort of hucksters in, in, in the world. And so this broad definition gives an agency like ours a great deal of authority. If somebody, uh, if these tokens, and there's five or 6,000 different projects, if these tokens have the attributes of an investment contract or a note, or have attributes of equities or bonds. And in essence, uh, one of the core uh, uh, issues is, is that there are platforms, trading platforms, 
where you can buy and sell these tokens, lending platforms where you can earn a return on these tokens that have not just dozens of tokens, but sometimes hundreds or thousands of tokens. And it's highly likely that they have on these platforms securities, investment contracts or notes or others that fit the definition of uh, security. Those platforms should come in, they should figure out how to register, be in an investment uh, investor protection remit. Now, not many have. And so I do really fear that uh, we'll keep bringing these enforcement cases, but there's gonna be a problem. There's gonna be a problem on lending platforms or trading platforms. And uh, frankly, when that happens, uh, I think a lot of people are gonna get hurt. It's a pretty big statement. So the, the question is whether you'd like uh, additional congressional authority to regulate in, in this new sphere. You mentioned that some of these uh, tokens may have the attributes of securities and they would fall under your well, uh, I actually, ambit. I actually think many of them, if I might say, I think uh, my predecessor, Jay Clayton, said it well in February or so of 2018. I think he had it right then. I think it's true in, in the fall of, of uh, 2021 is that many of these are securities. Look, it's a basic idea. If you, David, ask some of the listeners from this program to give them your money, something of value, and they were relying on you, David, with maybe five or 10 other entrepreneurs and computer scientists to uh, build a platform, uh, build a platform, that token and so forth, and, and they were giving it to you with an anticipation of profits. Our Supreme Court long ago said that's an investment contract. Just think about it. It's sort of a, a straightforward idea. You, David, raise some money. People are relying on you or relying on you in a common enterprise, anticipating profits. And as Thurgood Marshall wrote, we, you know, we, through Congress, painted with a broad brush. So um, I think it's it's many of these tokens, in fact, um, uh, that that. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, in terms of Congress, uh, I think that there are, uh, there are two market regulators here in this country. I was honored to uh, chair the sister agency, uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that oversees derivatives and has robust regulatory authority derivatives. It has various enforcement authorities on commodities. Some of these tokens, few of them, but some of these, are, have more of the attributes of commodities, most of them security, some have attributes of both. I think just how we coordinate, particularly that we have robust regulatory authorities that our sibling agency doesn't have, they have some authorities that we don't have, and how we coordinate. Also, how we might coordinate with the banking regulators on a new feature, uh, I don't know if you're going to go there, but on something called stable coins and how the banking agencies and we two market agencies coordinate because these stable coins may have attributes of investment contracts, uh, have some attributes like banking products, but the banking authorities right now don't have uh, the full gamut of what they need and how we work with Congress to sort through that. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. You're describing existing securities and banking laws as being broad. They, they were painted with a broad brush. You have definitions. Well, at least, at least the them. securities laws. At least the securities laws. So, so, so my question is uh, a simple one. Do you think you need additional congressional authorization to do what, in your judgment, is required to, to, to bring these instruments on, under under better regulation, scrutiny, transparency, or do you have enough authority given the way the laws are currently written? I, I think that we have robust authorities at the Securities and Exchange Commission, and we're gonna use them, continue. I think it would be better if the platforms that are uh, trading securities, the platforms that have lending products, who have what's called staking products, and I'm glad to describe that for your listeners, like every but where you project, actually put but... a coin at the platform and you earn a return. Um, that they come in and we sort through, figure out how best to get them within the perimeter. 
Um, we'll also be the couple and the B and bringing those enforcement actions as well. Working with Congress would help because there's a lot of coordination uh, by and amongst uh, our uh, financial regulators. Um, I would let the banking regulators speak uh, on their own, but we're working right now at the, under the guidance of Secretary Yellen and working on um, a report around stable coins. And in the world of stable coins, I do think that there would be some help from Congress. I do think that we can work with Congress uh, with regard to the coordination, again, uh, commodities and securities. But in terms of the SEC, I do think that we have um, robust authorities, uh, but there are gaps as I've identified them. So just to, to play uh, devil's advocate on this for, for a moment, the appeal of these new instruments of, of, of cryptocurrencies is precisely that they're not uh, mediated by, by banks, by existing uh, financial institutions, and that they're outside of traditional regulation. That, that's, that's part of why they've arisen. And the question is whether if you uh, institute the kind of regime you're talking about, that wouldn't just accelerate the push uh, of these uh, instruments into other jurisdictions, other, other unregulated areas. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a reverse arms race. Uh, they would, uh, people would find new ways to escape your scrutiny. Do you, are you worried about that? It's an interesting question. Um, David, new technologies come along, the internet came along and we, we all saw it popularized in the 1990s and question was the question, well, how is that gonna fit within our public policy goals and framework? Do we tax commerce on the internet? Uh, what about speech on the internet? And we had to sort through these things. So new technology is, is generally a good thing, it challenges the establishment, but I don't think that new technologies really long exist outside of public policy frameworks. Congress can come together and change it. They could say, look, leave it out. We, 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 we Congress don't mind if people are defrauded. We don't mind if people manipulate markets. I don't think that's what Congress is gonna say though. And, and that's what is all too often happening. This is a field, I've said it, publicly, it's rife with fraud and abuse and, and, and hucksters and, and the like. And it is, as you said, a global market, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there are innovations that are challenging finance. And that's a really exciting thing. It's why I studied it so closely at MIT. But I would also say that if it's gonna take off at all inside a public policy framework, and think about it, those projects, those five or 6,000 projects are raising money from the public. What else is an investment if it's not raising money from the public, anticipating profit, and the public is uh, hoping for a better retirement or a better vacation next year if they make some money on this crypto or that crypto. I'd lastly say, um, We've experimented uh, historically with private forms of money. In the US, um, uh, those of you listening might even remember something called the, 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 the wildcat banking era. And it is in, from the 1830s to the 1860s uh, after President Jackson got rid of the second bank of the US. Sorry for the history lesson, but we had banks issuing banknotes and they competed. Philadelphia banknotes were different than Baltimore banknotes and even within Philadelphia had different banknotes competing and the like. Well, that all, that all had a lot of costs, a lot of problems and so forth. And Abraham Lincoln put in place an oversight called the controller of the currency and then the Federal Reserve came 50 years later. And so public money has certain uh, a place around the globe. Private monies usually don't last that long. So I don't think there's a long-term viability uh, for five or 6,000 private forms of money. History tells us otherwise. So in the meantime, I think it's worthwhile to have an investor protection regime uh, uh, placed around us. Let me ask you about one interesting new development in this uh, area of, of regulation. 
The Wall Street Journal reported today that big U.S. and European banks had told the uh, Basel Committee for Banking Supervision, which is one of the uh, major global oversight uh, bodies that protects against financial risk, that setting standards uh, for, for regulation that would have strict capital requirements uh, for Bitcoin was something that they would uh, oppose. And I'm, I'm curious whether you've had a chance to look at that, whether you'd be in agreement with the position the banks took or whether you'd want to push back on that. Uh, I, I, David, I have not taken a close look at that, so I don't know. I mean, um, holding a, a highly volatile asset, Bitcoin is that. It's a digital, scarce, uh, uh, I would even say a speculative store of value. Um, uh, to hold appropriate capital if it's on a bank's balance sheet, um, would seem to fit into the remit that we've had in the past, that there'd be appropriate uh, shock absorbers against the potential loss. But I haven't seen that specific uh, release. Final quick question about crypto, and then I want to turn to, to another subject at, at the end. Basic question is, if uh, these cri cryptocurrencies, tokens were subject to relate, uh, regulation, investor protection. Is, is this basic process of uh, money outside of banks and mediation good for the United States? Is this, is this a, an aspect a of question, right? financial uh, uh, development, financial engineering that over the long run will be beneficial for us as an economy, beneficial for investors, or does it give you basic worries? So, and I've said this in the classroom and I've said it to my colleagues uh, uh, around the globe in the official sector. I think it's been a catalyst for change. Uh, Nakamoto signs innovation, uh, not only Bitcoin as the first sort of uh, one, but this whole distributed ledger technology has been a catalyst for change uh, that around the globe, central banks and the private sector are looking at how we can enhance our payment systems and enhancing our payment systems to make them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, real time at lower cost. And so there's some competition right now going on there. I also think it's raising new and interesting innovations around how exchanges work, and how, how even potentially um, uh, some forms of decentralized uh, lending. We've had peer-to-peer -peer lending for 15, 20 years. We've experimented with it. This is a new type of experiment. So those I think are, are really interesting innovations challenging the established uh, business models. On the other hand, I would say, I don't think it's a, is a good idea to wait until there's a spill in aisle three and we hear in the loud speakers, the loudspeakers overhead from the Washington Post and your competitors clean up in aisle three. And then those of us in the official sector have to rush in and we've got congressional hearings and we're sort of like, well, why wasn't anybody worried there was going to be a need for us, you know, clean up in aisle three. And I think at two trillion dollars, five or six thousand projects. Um, that uh, it would be better to be inside investor consumer protection, inside the uh, tax compliance and any money laundering and financial stability. Now, if we don't do anything and there's never a spill in I3, great. But I think history tells us private forms of money don't last long. History tells us that investment contracts outside an investment protection remit, people get hurt. That if we have lending platforms that are outside either the securities uh, uh, perimeter uh, or banking perimeter, that usually they get excess leverage and we have financial stability uh, issues. These stable coins are acting almost like poker chips at the casino right now. Uh, so add to the Wild West analogy. I mean, we've got Not a sure lot of casinos means, here in the Wild West and the poker chip is these stable coins, you know, at the casino gaming tables. And so I think there's just a lot of uh, kind of warning signs and flashing lights that we might have a spill in all three and I'd rather get ahead of it. 
So that's a, a clear uh, and ambitious agenda. Quick last question. Uh, you uh, uh, said recently that you're close to re publishing uh, an SEC report on uh, the GameStop uh, trading saga. How soon can we expect that? And can you give us uh, any sense of how detailed that will be and where it will take us? Well, I don't want to get ahead of my fellow commissioners. I'm, I'm honored to be chair of a five-member commission. And, and as I think I said last week, it's in front of my commission commissioners now, but uh, pretty soon. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of the details are already out. So maybe I'm lowering expectations a little bit because, uh, you know, the Organizations like the Washington Post and others have written extensively on the events in January. So uh, I want to thank uh, Chair Gary Gensler for a fascinating discussion of one of the hottest topics in global finance. Uh, you've really uh, given us a, a I think, clear view of, of what's on your plate, what you're thinking about doing. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, David. Thank you all for listening. Well, that was pretty so, quick. So uh, please come back uh, to. All right, so I'm just going to shut that down. Um, if there's any questions you guys have, please leave them in the chat. My hunch is there. I mean, he really said he, with these thousands of DeFi projects that I get under the classifications, they are securities. But it seems pretty clear to me that he's, he's interested in coming after them. So uh, you have to imagine he's coming after the big ones first. Um, I noticed someone in the in the comments here said, well, at least he has a, an appreciation for the technology. That's definitely true. He did teach a course on this. He's he definitely knows what he's talking about in, in some sense. It doesn't sound like he's a you know a huge fan, but um he, he was put in this position to do to do his job and and he has to execute. Um see a lot of questions about if this was positive or negative. I don't think it's gonna change anything today. But I do think, you know, he said a lot of people are going to get hurt. And I think that's going to be retail at the end of the day when they go after platforms like, you know, the biggest DeFi projects that you can think of when they go after a compound or Uniswap or whoever it is. If there's people in the United States, they do have a lot of power there. Um, so I think folks could get hurt. Uh, one example with Uniswap, like, um, yeah, Alejandro has a great question here. I'll just highlight it. So what could you do against Uniswap? Well, the project will live on on Ethereum. So you can always use Uniswap v2, v3, actually v1 as well. That's always going to be there. But the Uni token holds value because you're all, you're betting on Uniswap Labs delivering more products, right? Yes, you can turn on swap fees for v3, but if they want, they can go after the team. They can shut the team down, shut the company down. And yes, the token could still have some value because you can get swap fees from different swaps in v3, v2, v1. But there's going to be no v4 then, right? I mean, perhaps the, the team could leave the country, go somewhere else, but, you know, <laughs> it would certainly hurt the tokens price, that's for sure. Uh, let's see. Anyone? Good question. So here, analogy about stablecoins being casino chips at a poker table. Um, yeah, I mean, the, st the centralized stablecoins have held their pe peg well, and same with some of the decentralized ones. So... Yes, I mean, in a sense, you're kind of cashing in your dollars for these chips that live on the blockchain, but I don't see, like USDC has done a great job. I don't, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it specifically. Uh, someone asked what happened with ETH. I don't think he mentioned ETH at all. And I'm not sure if you're talking about price. It looks like I just pulled the chart up on my phone on Coinbase. It looks like the market is pretty much does not care. It seems like it must have been priced in or everything that happened yesterday at the Masari conference uh, is probably factored in. What authority would they have with the DAO? So this, this is an interesting question, David. Um, so in the United States, uh, uh, yes, there is a Wyoming DAO now, which is an option, but there's really not much differentiation with a DAO and a company. So for instance, if I started a DAO and invited all of you to invest in the DAO and we invested in various projects, if someone wanted to sue that DAO, if that was you know a government entity or an individual that felt slighted, I could still be named on the lawsuit, right? Like even though it's a DAO and we all have some type of voting rights, there's still probably a leader of that DAO. Um, and so you can really make people's lives tricky, which is not great. Uh, let's see here. How is it enforceable? Well, the projects will live on, but you can always punish the people. So. I think that how how it 
to answer that. Um, question about LUSD. So this is a great question. Liquidity has the only true decentralized governance-free stablecoin. I have a video of it on my channel. I think it's an amazing product. And, and I think this is correct. I mean, again, you can go after the people that don't live in the US, but the stablecoin will live on and will keep its peg because it's backed solely by ETH. So it would be impossible to take that off the blockchain, which means we will always have at least one option. Uh, let's see. Ykit asks, hey, Ykit, I know him in real life. Um, just joined and missed the whole thing. Well, you can always, this is going to live on so you can rewind it or go to the Washington Post. I'm sure they have a recording. As far as future actions on stable coins, it's it's so tough to say. I mean, I do see them going after someone like USDT, who has obviously not disclosed their holdings, and there's some questionable things going on there. But for something like USDC, that from my understanding is audited, um, Circle is obviously going public, and, and they're doing everything they can to follow the book. My hunch is that, I mean, it's it's so hard to imagine something like that getting killed. I mean, they would do more harm than good shutting down USDC or even USDT. I mean, these things are just such a part of DeFi that it would really destroy the markets. And I, I really have to believe that they're not after doing that. So any thoughts on UST as a decentralized stablecoin? So UST, my thoughts are that it's it's not a decentralized stablecoin. Um, so Terraform Labs defends the peg of UST with off-chain uh, with off-chain money that they have. In addition, the Luna token is half held by Terraform Labs, I believe, or somewhere around 50%. So it's not a decentralized stablecoin. I think um, there could definitely be something there. Um, right now, you know, Luna does hope to become decentralized in the future, but we're just not there yet. Let's see. So they're looking out for us by punishing us. Well, I don't think, you know, I have to believe these people, like, they're trying to do their job. They think what they're doing is right. And they think in the long run, it will protect us. But even to, to, to Gary's point, a lot of people will get hurt when they start going after or if they ever start going after specific companies. Should have asked about yield bearing products on stables. I'm sh Yeah, I mean, I think he mentioned something like that. And he was saying that's clearly not something that that is allowed. Um, again, very hard to enforce. But yeah. Leo Min has thoughts on DAI. Well, I think DAI is safe, but right now, you know, 50, I think 60% of the circulating DAI is backed by USDC as collateral. So it's kind of like a wrapped USDC, but you have some protections there that all of the USDC in maker's contract is kind of lumped together. So they would have to attack the whole system, which again, that's many billions of dollars. And I, I don't see that happening. So I see, I see it as a safe bet. Oh, this is a fun question. How would Frax adapt if they go after USDC? So a lot of folks know here, I'm a big fan of Frax. It was the first video I did on the channel. Um, and right now Frax is, you know, they're obviously heavily backed by USDC, but they're trying to decentralize away from that. So now some collateral is backed by DAI. A lot of their USDC is compound USDC or Abe USDC. So it's deposited in these money markets earning a yield. So I think Frax is kind of becoming similar to DAI, even though they do hope to get more away from USDC than DAI is. So I think, you know, it would be a very tough problem for Frax if USDC went away tomorrow, but I think I think they'll figure it out. I hope so. I mean, I, I love the project. Sam is a good friend and big fan of his. The only effect is pushing innovation out of the USA. I, yeah, my hunch is that's, that's a big part of it. Um, you can deploy a project anywhere and anyone can access it from anywhere. I mean, we all have VPNs. If you live in the US, you can access anything on the blockchain. And, you know, I tend to agree with this. I think right now the US, from my understanding, is still the head of innovation here. And I would love to see that happen. I work in DeFi, so I'm a big proponent of that. But yeah, I think that would happen. I mean, if you if you went after the Uniswap team, for example, and you threw Hayden in jail, I don't even know if that's possible. But like, of course, everyone that's working on DeFi that's passionate about it, like myself, is going to want to leave to a place where one, they're paying less in taxes because we do spend a lot here. And two, they're, they're not going to be punished for what they're building. Uh, more plates asks, do I think teams will leave? I don't think that's going to happen yet. I mean, we're building our team in the US and 
taking on investors here and we're really excited to be here. Um, but I think if things start to change over the next year or so, yeah, I think it definitely could have an effect. Well, this is a fun one. How will blockchain technology provide carbon neutrality in the next century? So neutrality is interesting. I, I can't say about that, but the switch from proof of work to proof of stake from an Ethereum standpoint will definitely help. Um, we're seeing all of the new blockchains being built today are proof of stake. So aside from Bitcoin, really everything is moving to proof of stake, which is much less energy intensive than something like proof of work, which is basically Bitcoin. Um, so I think we'll get there. Um, I can't comment on Bitcoin because I don't follow it too much, but I know there are some thoughts on renewables there. But at the end of the day, like it's a lot of energy that's being used and it, it needs to be consumed. And whether you're getting it from solar or from gas or coal, that energy could have been used for something else. So I think, you know, that's the bear case for Bitcoin, but the proof of stake chains like Ethereum hopes to be and some like Luna, Solana, et cetera, are a lot more energy efficient. Let's see here. Is it guaranteed that the SEC goes after Tether? No, I don't think it's guaranteed yet. I don't think anything's guaranteed. It's tough to say if that's a huge priority for them. I mean, you know, perhaps they'll want to go through the books and see what Tether actually has on their balance sheet. But my hunch is like, yes, Tether is shady, but is it the biggest problems in the SEC's point of view? I mean, or would they rather go after things that like, let's be realistic, are securities under the law that they clearly have jurisdiction over? So we'll see. I don't think anything's guaranteed at this point. Safest farming for yield since Gary is going to rug us. Use decentralized products, use decentralized blockchains if you're really concerned about that. Personally, I'm not changing anything I do because of thoughts of centralization risk, et cetera. But if that's something you're worried about, go for decentralized projects. I mentioned Li Liquidy, Uniswap, the product itself is decentralized. There's a ton of truly decentralized products on Ethereum. Would Uniswap and Curve change their offering under regulation? Well, that, that's just not possible. I mean, these products live on the blockchain. They're governed on the blockchain. So even if Hayden said tomorrow, I want to change Uniswap and follow the rules, maybe that's what V4 is when it eventually is released. But V3 and V2, V1 will always stay as they are. All right. A lot of really cool questions here. I'm just going to keep going through them as long as you guys have them. If the U.S. bans interest-bearing products, so what would happen to others and people outside of the U.S.? My hunch is a project is not going to ban it, but they're going to, on the front end, limit access to Americans. So if you're in the U.S., buy, purchase a VPN. If you're out of the U.S., I wouldn't worry about it until your country starts to regulate it. But at the end of the day, there's always ways to spook your location and change where your Internet is telling you, you know, the service you're from is. So it's it's not too hard to get around it. If you can get around the Chinese firewall with a VPN, you can definitely get around any US bans on interest bearing products. All right, let's see here. Could they use centralized stablecoins to target protocols? Yes. I mean they can. Will they? I don't know. I mean I'd have to look at the USDC and USDT issuance, but it's hundreds of billions of dollars now. To take that, rip that value off the blockchain is so extreme. And it's hard to imagine that the SEC has the jurisdiction to seize those assets. I mean, maybe they get it, but I wouldn't picture them just essentially rugging everyone. I mean, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think their intentions are they're trying to figure out a good solution. I hope so. Quick shout out to the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the questions are awesome. So I'm going to keep taking them. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, immediately. if a digital U.S. dollar, I assume you mean a government issued dollar, could live on blockchains and work with them, would the role of stable coins be redundant? Great question. So yes and no. Um, if you live in the U.S., if you're following everything by the book, if you don't care about your privacy, and, and that's totally fine, that's a lot of people, then yeah, I mean, the government option is always going to be safer. It's going to be like some sort of FDIC insured or backed by the government, safe, secure, etc., but I think we'll always have these private options. Like LUSD is a great example. There's nothing anyone can do to take the value away from that stable coin. It's backed purely by ETH, which the SEC has said is not a security. They've officially come out and said that. It's unregulatable. It's too de decentralized. So I think we're going to see both. I think if there was a CBDC, central bank 
uh, whatever it stands for, like a US issued dollar on the blockchain. Most people will use that. Institutions will use that and that's fine. But I think there's always going to be two options. All right. Instead of pegging to an inflationary currency, is it possible viable to create an energy-backed stablecoins? So I don't know about an energy-backed stablecoins and would like some clarity on what you mean by that. But I will say Frax, obviously I'm a fan of the project, have a bias there, but they're working on something called the FPI, the Frax Price Index. So they're trying to create a stable value coin that basically tracks inflation and purchasing power in the US. So I think that's a cool project. Uh, we'll see where they take that. And I know there's also Rye, which you know is a stable-ish token that hovers around two to three dollars based on ETH's price. So here we have a comment that uh, Filippo thinks my feeling is that regulation, as long as it does not mean make crypto accessible only to accredited investors, will not be in that negative. Yeah, it's an interesting take. I mean, I think there will be some, some short-term pain. Projects will have problems. Token valuations will go up. They'll go down. That's for sure. But I agree. I mean, a lot of banks and institutions are waiting for regulation, and they need that to to put some serious money in. So it would, if there was clear regulation that was healthy regulation, I think that could be a bullish thing. That could be a good thing. And I think you know, all of us that are working in DeFi and passionate about it want to work with the regulators. Like we want to do what we can to help. So. Thoughts on sensible regulation? Yeah, I kind of just touched on that. So I want the SEC to go after the pump and dumps and the scams. If you're based in the US and you're deploying a scam project that really has no value and you're capturing a ton of value and it's like it's not innovative, it's a pump and dump, then like, yes, you're scamming the public and I think you should be held accountable. If you're creating a legitimate project like a Uniswap, a Compound, Aave, I think that's a healthy thing and should be left alone, frankly. I mean... Perhaps there could be some regulations about secu around security audits that you can't just <laughs> launch a project that's not audited, not secure and vulnerable. But, you know, we kind of need that now. We're in the early innings. People want to experiment. But I, I do think it can be done sensibly. And I would like to see the SEC go after the Blaine scams. Like, please stop targeting Uniswap, making them take off securities. Like, Uniswap was forced to take off mirror um, assets. So basically mirrored stocks or synthetic stocks. It, it doesn't seem right to go after Uniswap that's trying to offer something good as opposed to there's so many scams that everyone falls through when falls for when they come into this industry. So please go after the scams, not the good projects. All right, let's see here. Proof of stake has some decentralization problems. So my hunch is that the biggest risk here is that it doesn't cost much to run a validator, so you can keep all of your ETH rewards. So if you stake, if you create 10 validators or 20 validators, which you can do, so you have 320 ETH staked, etc., you can just keep raking in all of that profit and not selling your ETH and just accumulating a large position. So that's the first major risk. And the second major risk is that a company like Coinbase or Lido or Binance, they offer a proof of stake staking solution for users. If everyone ends up using those and Coinbase or Binance controls the majority of the network, that would be a huge problem. So it's something I'm watching. I hope, you know, I know the Ethereum Foundation and stakeholders in the community are looking out for it. So yeah, my hope is it never becomes a serious issue, but we will see. And, you know, if at some point ETH becomes non-decentralized, I will, I will speak out against it. I'm not, I don't have a bias to the point where I won't, won't speak out against it. So where would I place NFTs in all of this? Yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I think NFTs are, are really just a product. I don't know if I would consider them a security. I would say they're not really on the radar of the SEC. If you buy CryptoPunk, I mean, you're buying a piece of art. Yes, there is some hope of it going up, but no one's you know controlling that, contributing to the project anymore. It just is in its final form. So and, and there's no promise of future cash flow. So I don't think NFTs really are there yet. I mean, it's yes, NFTs will in like a Uniswap V3 NFT. Sure, that like could be regulated, but NFT in the art sense, I don't see it happening. All right. Wrapped BCC and ETH are safe enough. I mean, yeah, they're audited, they're secure, but wrapped BTC is centralized. There is a centralized party that stores the BTC that gets sent to the wrapper contract. And to take it out, uh, you have to be kind of like an accredited institution. 
there are better wrapping services like RenBTC and TBTC. Uh, TBTC is, I think, fully decentralized. RenBTC is getting there. As far as wrapped ETH, I wish I knew more, but my hunch is there's probably a centralization component like WBTC, but I'm not positive. So I'll do some research on that. All right. Have I heard about crypto lobbies being formed? The only one I'm really familiar with is the one that Uniswap vote that went out that was very controversial to fund kind of like a lobbying DeFi research institute uh, with some universities, I believe. Um, at the time, it was very controversial, but my hunch is that, you know, maybe at the time Uniswap, that's when the SEC first started talking with them and they they wanted to jump the gun, gun on it. And I don't hear people complaining against this anymore. Um, I think people are happy there's someone with some money lobbying for crypto, but yeah, and also on crypto Twitter, when all of this conversation was happening with that infrastructure bill, there was a lot of outpour of support. So I think there is some help there. All right. So main target is Uniswap and PancakeSwap. I'd say Uniswap could be a main target. I don't really follow PancakeSwap. It's on BSC, so probably not a huge focus of the U.S. government just because BSC is obviously a Chinese product. Um, but yeah. If you can use a VPN, you can probably, I mean, if you could, like I said, if you can use a VPN to get around the Chinese firewall, then I'm sure you, like the SEC regulations, if they ever come to fruition, are not going to be that cumbersome to get around. So we'll see. Your choice for VPN. Well, I use like ExpressVPN, but I just saw some thread that you shouldn't use that. So I'll have to get back to you guys on, on VPNs. But I'm sure if you Google it, you can probably find stuff. Ave and Balancer have hinted at being prepared to support KYC. So I know Ave is offering an institutional product or researching that. I don't know about Balancer. I think they could. I think they could offer a KYC product, but it's hard to imagine the SEC being happy, them living like a double life of having a KYC institutional product and then a non-KYC product where like regular users that are not accredited investors get a yield on things. So it's definitely a product they can offer that people want and institutions want because they're safe, sustainable yields. But yeah, we'll see. What is your opinion on the actually? So yeah, like I was, you know, said a couple times, these are my favorite products, the most decentralized ones that are truly decentralized. I understand that a lot of projects have to be centralized at the start and decentralize away as time goes on, just because it's easier to grow fast then. But yeah, I'm obviously most bullish on the true decentralized products. Um, but that said, like if the team is in the US, there is some vulnerability there. Current state of decentralized front ends. Um, yeah, Liquidity is doing a great job on that. They don't even run a front end, the company itself. Um, I know, if, you know, after the things with Uniswap and Mirror and Synthetics tokens happened and those were removed from the front end, some Uniswap clones popped up, their front end clones. I don't think those have become popular, but I'm not too worried about this because like at the end of the day, it is so easy to launch a forked front end if you can do it in a few hours. So I'm not, you know, if we need that, it'll come. Um, let's see. How do I think blockchain <laughs> technology will change gaming? That's a very different question, but I think, or very different than the theme of this talk, but just quickly, I think Play to Earn is here to stay. I think it's it's going to be awesome. Like I, I was shameless, shamefully addicted to World of Warcraft like years ago in high school, and there was like a lot of trading and there was an economy in the game, and it was a lot of fun. And I think people are going to want to do that with digital assets. So I think that's going to be a you know there's going to be L twos and side chains fully dedicated to this. So I think I'm bullish on it. All right, let's see. Click. Could, what's this? Could corporations acquire projects? Well, you can acquire the team, but the tokens, like what circuit, you know, you can acquire the team and the company if the company has tokens on the treasury. But if the, you know, let's just say the token was fully diluted and all the Aave tokens are out there. Well, like, yes, you could buy, you could acquire the Aave team in-house, but the upside is the token there. And so maybe you acquire the team and you build out Aave too, but there's no guarantee that works, which is kind of cool if you think about it. Like once the tokens are out there, and the token supply is fixed, there's really not going to be an acquisition acquisition from a big tech company, which is pretty cool. 
just subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Everyone subscribe if you haven't yet and check out some videos. Um, I like to think I do a good job here. Do I believe Ripple will win? No comment. I, I saw an article a couple of weeks ago that they had a big win in court. Um, and the great thing about our justice system in the U.S. is there is like a higher burden of proof on the accuser. So it's possible. We'll see. Um, but, I, you know, I do generally believe in our justice system here. SEC backed audit team would help maybe. It's an interesting idea. I don't think they want to take that liability. Um, also, my, you know, if the SEC stamps a project as audited by them and something happens, are they liable? Is it insured by the U.S. government, the SEC? So I think that's probably a road they don't want to go down. But that would be interesting. That would be one way to help people. <laughs> it's just in-house audit projects. But who knows if they could even have find the talent? I mean, it's tough to find auditors now. All right. What are some possible solutions if one entity gains too much control over validators? I think there are solutions. I'm not like a core infrastructure expert here, but I'd imagine you could like you could end up doing like a hard fork of the chain that was, you know, there was consensus around that capped the number of validators or the percent of validators that one organization could have. Obviously, you can Sybil attack that, meaning you could kind of create a new identity and, and still do that. Um, so I agree it is a risk here, but I'm not a security. I'm not an expert on this infrastructure. So I'll have to do research and get back to you guys in the tele, in the Discord chat if you're there. All right. Um, <laughs> I am seeing titles after the Gensler. Yes. So there's going to be clickbait everywhere. Like people just want to monetize these videos and this content. I wouldn't take too much into it. The market does, as far as when I last checked, I mean, you guys can update me in the chat, but the market did not care about this. It's priced in, it's expected. Um, yeah, it looks like BTC is maybe slightly down, but it's crypto. It's very volatile anyway. John says, thank you. Thank you so much, John, for watching. I hope you're in the Discord. If you are, reach out. I would love to chat with you and really appreciate your support. Thoughts on China's strategy on uh, for being decentralized and having... Oh, she is. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, so I wish I could comment. I just have not heard of that project. Um. Seems like companies will just leave. Leaving is a hard thing to do, and it's not a popular thing to do. So I, I think if companies leave, they will have to. But like, just think about how Coinbase would leave. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine. It's a huge company. It's publicly traded. Maybe not Coinbase, Coinbase but maybe a, com a smaller company or a DeFi company. All right. Yeah, Snow this is what I was talking about on Twitter. Thanks more played. So Snowden, I was talking about VPNs. He said Express VPN is suspect. Like perhaps they can the company itself can track your location. So do some research on there, search on Twitter and see if there's a best better option. How does one value Luna at a yeah, so it's a good question. So I don't personally value Luna based on the UST market cap since I don't think the UST market cap actually correlates directly with the Luna token just because Terraform Labs is defending the peg of UST off chain. So all of that value doesn't necessarily accrue to Luna. But I will say like if, yeah, they have like two, three projects live right now. If they had 60 projects that were all innovative and doing something different, then like that is a great value proposition. Um Surely this is better than ETH. We'll see. I mean, I haven't seen, we don't see much new innovation on different chains than Ethereum, but when we start to see that, or if we ever do, that's when I'd start to like take a much bigger interest when I see the developers, the most innovative developers moving over. All right. Do you like XRP? I just subscribed. Thanks for subscribing. I don't hold any XRP. I don't know too much about it. I'd be with the reg, like the ongoing fight, the legal fight they're having. I'd be scared of it, but perhaps it's a bet with a lot of upside, just because everyone assumes they're going to lose the fight in court, and so maybe if they win, there's a huge boom in in price there. But I'm not familiar with the project, so not someone to be trusting there. All right, wow, still a lot of questions. Can I provide some insights on Brink? I would be happy to. So Brink is the project I'm working on. Uh, they mentioned Gelato here, which uh, I don't know if I'd say competitor necessarily, but they're going after a similar concept of automation. 
So as far as Brink goes, if you're going to ETH Lisbon or LizCon or the Taoist, we're going to have the presence there. I'm going to be there. So definitely come and stop by and say hi. Uh, we just got our audit results back. There are no major problems. All of the minor bugs are being addressed now. And um, yeah, we're chugging along. We have a big announcement coming up uh, regarding fundraising. So stay tuned for that. Um, follow the Brink Twitter if you haven't yet. And uh, But I'll obviously share when we can announce everything publicly. Uh, but good news. All right. Can I show my altcoin bags in the comments? Please don't. No one listens to that. Like, no, I appreciate you asking. It's very kind of you. But at the end of the day, no one here is going to read the comments and make, make a decision off it. So I don't think it's going to do much good. Uh, Fud Zero, who I know in the community, uh, check out Mulvlad VPN. Haven't heard of it, but maybe worth checking out. Um, my two cents from Ethereum girl, US won't leave crypto. We'll just wait for litigation to explain the rules and code it in. Yeah, we'll see. I think I think crypto, you know, the US is the home for innovation right now in the world. There are competitors, of course, but right now the US is the home for free innovation. And I hope that continues. Um, a lot of people shilling XRP. Are you participating in any of the Kusama auctions? I'm not. I probably should be, though. I'm sure they're all doing very well. Um, NFTs for governance instead of fungible tokens or ERC twenties. I think this is awesome. I, I love it. I've been, you know, thinking about how we could experiment with that in the community. So if you have questions about that or advice, leave comments below. But yeah, I think it's very cool that you know people purchase a ticket to join a DAO or like a piece of art that they're aligned with, and it gives them voting rights over the DAO or over a community. So I, I think that's cool. I think it puts everyone on a level playing field. So you can't just buy ten percent of the supply and control the vote. NFTs would really spread it out. And at the end of the day, you can always sell it on the market, which is cool. And you could potentially profit from it. Enjoy being scared. Thoughts on BlockFi or Celsius? Yeah, so those are perhaps like, that's perhaps the lowest hanging fruit for, for the SEC to go after. I mean, they're offering interest bearing products that I think Gary basically said was not welcome. So yeah, we'll see. I, I don't, your funds are going to be saved is my hunch. I mean, the SEC is not going to, the SEC is not going to come in and say, we're, you're done, BlockFi. We're taking all of the ETH you're holding. Like the, the customer will get it back. I mean, this is the U.S. government. They're not going to steal from you. But those companies, sure, maybe they won't be able to offer their interest products anymore. Make Maybe a 10K profile picture project for the first 10,000 wallets to interact with Brink to show OG status. That's a pretty cool idea. I like that idea. Um, is there any bad news and it looks like we're running out of questions so if you have any last minute ones include them here before i sign off is there any bad news i don't think there's any new like crazy new news but gary gensler was pretty adamant that they're going to go after the six thousand or seven thousand tokens he was talking about that are probably securities and so who knows it, you know sounds like they'll go after the biggest biggest projects first but uh we'll see The vi what's the viability of purely anonymous developer teams working on new projects to avoid regulation? Well, in the U.S., I'd, ima I'd imagine if the U.S. government wants to dox or find out who the Anon developer team is, they can do it. I mean, we've seen what the NSA can do based on the Snowden re you know, revelations. My hunch is even if you do everything you can and follow the best security practices, if it's high profile, if you become high profile enough, they can find you. So. Yeah, I think being anonymous makes sense for a lot of reasons, but at the end of the day, I would I would still be concerned about the government finding you if you're an anonymous developer of a controversial project. The U.S. government isn't going to steal from you, maybe just your tax money, but uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, they're not going to seize your ETH. They're just not. They're not going to seize your BTC. They may do everything they can to make it worthless, but they're not going to physically take possession unless they follow the, the legal process, which I don't think any court is going to do. We have very good property rights here in the US. Let's see, how do you get a job in DeFi automation? What skills do you need? I automate now, but just to pay the bills for myself and my family. So I don't know if you're a developer or not. If you're a developer, then the jobs are coming to you. I mean, if you're a developer and you're skilled, you can find work, that's for sure. If you if you're not a developer and you're like myself, you're not technical, I would join communities of projects you like. Like if you like 
Uniswap and you can contribute to the community, I'm sure the DAO will reward you for that. Uh, just in, as, as an example, I'm a multi-sig for the Tornado Community Treasury. It's a privacy project, a big fan of it. And uh, there's like small compensation for that. So I think if you can establish yourself, join a community, you can definitely find work. And then once you have a name for yourself, it's very easy to get offers. I mean, in DeFi, everyone's always looking for new talent. All right, we have a comment here. Stock tokens are the future of NFTs. Uh, Ex-CEO of NASDAQ said that all stocks and bonds can and will be tokenized. That would be cool. I don't I don't know who Bob Griffield is. I didn't hear this, but that, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us that really believe in Ethereum believe that Ethereum will become the global settlement layer. And part of that is having our equities markets fully on chain. And there's obviously a lot of huge advantages to this. There's some disadvantages, but I think the people that are full in on DeFi believe that. In response to this, what would you advise against trading in the future months? So I, you know, if you follow my channel and my community, you probably know I don't really advise trading. There's a lot of data out there that for the average person, the more you trade, the less you earn. Like the more you trade, the more bad decisions you make. It's better to buy and hold and uh, potentially dollar cost average into things. And, and this is the standard financial advice. So me personally, I don't trade much. I actually try, you know, I get excited about projects like everyone else and I do buy tokens. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I always make sure that I'm mindful and, you know, rotating back into a safe position of, for me, mostly holding ETH. And I have a video on that as well on my channel. I think it's called why you shouldn't handpick different DeFi tokens or DeFi projects. So if you want to hear my full thoughts on that, there is that video, which I think is a pretty good resource. So I would advise you to trade as little as possible and just make, do a lot of research, make high conviction bets and, and follow the market. It's hard to beat the market. Most people can't, obviously. Will the EU follow the same rules of the SEC? Yeah, it's an interesting question. The U.S. does set the tone here, so I, I don't know. I think there, we'll see. I, I really can't give that a thoughtful answer just because I'm not familiar with EU rules. But my hunch is like if the U.S. sets the law, other countries follow it for whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Let's see. What is cease and desist? Yeah, again, I mean, this, if you think about it, it's hard to imagine that, say we love Coinbase, Coinbase gets a cease and desist order. It's hard to imagine that all of your funds get frozen. I mean, there would be class action lawsuits across the country against federal officials, the federal government. I mean, the, the US government cannot just take your property. Like the US government can't come into your house and they can't steal your laptop, for example. Like you need a warrant to do that. They need to hit like a legal barrier excuse me like they have to reach some type of legal conclusion get approved by a judge and i just don't see that happening is terra ust going to be safe yeah there were rumors about do Kwan being subpoenaed by the sec yesterday at the masari mainnet conference i think the general consensus is it wasn't him it was a different team but you know i think i think it's hard for me to give a secure recommendation on that but the Terraform Labs team is defending the peg of UST. Yes, UST is regulatable, but again, it's so hard to imagine any regulation just directly ripping all of that value out of UST and essentially stealing money from the end user. Like it would be like the government taking all of the value of USDC. I just, it's hard to imagine that happening. It would just be so unhealthy for so many people. So it would slow down mass adoption, but it wouldn't slow down development, which is the most important part. I mean, all of these teams, we've all had great success fundraising because of this crazy bull market. We've Everyone's stockpiled a ton of cash, um, whether it's the company's cash to fund further development or our projects have large treasuries now that I wouldn't be worried about development. But, I, you know, if ETH goes to $500 tomorrow or BTC crashes, then, yeah, you know, less people are going to want to hold BTC. But that's great for us. I mean, I'm, I personally want a bear market. Uh, the company, our company, Brink, is going to survive. We we can do that, fortunately. And I want time to buy ETH cheap because I, I believe in it. So I think it would be a good thing for all of us listening that are still on the call now. If there's a bear market, you should be excited. As long as all of your money is not on blockchain, which I recommend. Blockchains are, yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, 
So, you know, I, I'm a big believer in privacy. I think the direction Ethereum going is, is you know, zero knowledge proofs and uh, totally anonymous transactions. I think that's what E3 or 4 could be. And I know a lot of the Ethereum community and DeFi community is about privacy. So I think privacy is always going to be a big part of blockchain. I'm for it. Um, but I agree with your t- point as well. Like it, the best part about blockchain is also that transparency aspect where we can see who's buying what, who's doing what. Um, yeah. Stablecoin you'd recommend? I mean, USDC is probably the safest, right? I, I think there's the general consensus there. Um, as far as centralized stablecoins, USDC, as far as decentralized stablecoins, the only truly decentralized governance free stablecoin is LUSD. So your hands are kind of tied there. Sorry, I didn't mean. Okay, so this person that I, you know, I answered that trading question. They meant investing in the DeFi space. Yeah. So he, Gary said straight up, he said, people are going to get hurt. We're going to come after these projects. Like if the SEC served Uniswap and really came after the team, I'd imagine the token price could be hurt. So I think it is something to be mindful of. Um, Yeah, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, it's always safer to limit your DeFi token holdings and maximize your like main coin holdings like ETH. Uh, just because these DeFi tokens are very dependent on the price of ETH. So they will outperform ETH in a bull market, but in a bear market, they underperform it. And in addition, now we're taking on that regulation risk by holding the DeFi token. So yeah, it's probably makes sense to have more of your portfolio in, you know, more stable, more popular, higher market cap assets like BTC, ETH, etc. cetera. Spirit Wolf 9 just sub. Thank you so much. I hope you join the Discord if you're like active and want to talk more. We have a great community there, great moderators. Have I con- considered renouncing like many whales? No, I haven't yet. I don't I don't see that happening. Um I like living in the US. Um so no. Puerto Rico though, it's a good option. There's no no capital gains tax there. And I'm also, also I'm not a whale, so um let's see. Why does Kraken always seem out of danger? I just, yeah, I have no idea. I don't think most people talk about Kraken, so maybe that's why it's just out of the, the public eye. Um, this person, uh, Anonymous, asks, I don't think interest based products will go. Won't the exchanges just comply? Coinbase is registering for futures. So, my understanding is Coinbase just gave up on the, they had a USDC interest bearing product that was going to earn like 4%, I think, I want to say. And I think the SEC came after them and said, don't do that. And they, and they backed down because they have to, they're a public company. They have thousands of employees They just don't have an option. All right. So Ethereum girl said she's a developer, but value my privacy. So yeah, I mean, you can still, you can, you can still work privately. Um, and I think you should have no problem finding work as a, as this talented developer. Um, as long as you have a GitHub, you can have an anonymous GitHub that anyone can publicly view. And there's a collection of work people can look at. I think you're in good shape. Why are crypto enthusiasts such ostriches? 90% of DeFi is a complete scam and funded by token printing. Yeah, I mean, most of DeFi is a scam, right? But to paint all of DeFi as a broad brush and to regulate all of DeFi is probably unfair. So I, I agree with you. I want to see these scams go away. I hate hearing stories of people investing in scam projects. I hear it all the time, literally every day. And it, I hate it because that's that's not what, what this industry can be. So I, I do want there to be regulation for the scams, no doubt about it. Per asks, as an investor, how much cash flow do you like sitting on? Do you mean like just regular income from work in, in fiat? Um, I'm actually, so I'm like 80% invested in US equities in the stock market, uh, like 15% in crypto. And, and the reason for that is because I work in crypto, so I already have like long tail exposure to the upside and downside of crypto. Um, I hate having cash flow. Yeah, I mean, if you can get a safe APY, APR in DeFi, do it. Um, and if you can use a centralized platform like BlockFi, Celsius, whatever, Coinbase, you should do it. Like get that, get a yield in a safer way. Um, but you always need to have an emergency fund. So just don't go all in. But I'm sure everyone is telling you that. Video on the safest place to store crypto. I do have a video on my favorite hardware wallet. Uh, it's called... A grid plus um, basically they give you like a bunch of these cards that you need to use to access your wallet and it's all pin protected fully secure um, so i have a video on that hardware wallet uh somewhere on my channel it's called the grid plus lattice one 
and I can speak to their team. They're great people. I know them personally. So, Someone said down so bad. So I'm curious what the Mars thoughts on Cardano. So Cardano's, I mean, it's a com I don't want to alienate fans. I don't have any Cardano holdings. Um, I don't particularly believe in the project. I don't like the way Charles talks about his work and whatnot. Um, yeah, I, you know, I hope the best for them. I hope they build a successful project. I know they had some problems with their smart contracts and concurrent transactions, but um, at the end of the day, like competition for ETH and for other DeFi platforms and blockchains is a good thing. So I, I hope it works out for them. Ben says, thanks for going live. Thanks so much for watching. Um, price of BTC. It looks like it's down a bit, but not nothing crazy. It looks like it's at 42,000, which to be expected. Um, do you think Tether's at risk because of Evergrande? So there were rumors floating around that, that Tether was holding Chinese paper basically like a claim to cash flow of Evergrande, I would want to say. My hunch is probably not. We'll see. I, I don't. I would think the market would have kind of reacted if that was true and insiders would have reacted, but we'll see. I, I don't think so. I don't hold Tether personally. I, if I'm going to hold a centralized stable coin, it's just going to be USDC. But if something happened to Tether, it would probably be bad for the macro blockchain economy. I'll accumulate all of my income in crypto in five years if I, if I have to. Can't spend it on anything else, so fuck it. Um, good luck. That's probably risky. I mean, crypto goes up, it goes down. All right. Uh, Par asks, can you make a paid private group? I love your content, and I'm scared you're going to get too big. The Discord is a great size right now. I love what I'm doing. If the Discord's unmanageable, like yes, that could be an option, but we'll see. I don't have plans there yet, but thank you for the kind words. All right. Gary Gensler said the SEC already had enough powers. My hunch is that's right. I mean, a lot of these DeFi tokens fall under securities, which they have jurisdiction over. Um, I think they're prob they're working they're doing both. They're working with Congress and they're seeing what they can do without it. Um, yeah. Why is the SEC so corrupt? I mean, this is a tough question, right? It's hard to say they even are. I mean, if let's just say I was put in Gary's position. When you take that oath to take that position, you're meant to defend the law as it's given to you by Congress. Like he's not the one making the rules. He's choosing how to enforce it. So if you take that perspective, like I can see why he, he can say like, I'm just doing my job. This is what Congress told me to do. This is how the law is written. These are securities. People are getting hurt. Like I can, I'm not saying, I don't think he's necessarily a bad person. He just believes he's doing the right thing, which in our perspective, he's not. So, but hopefully they do shut down the scams as, as best as they can. If they come after ETH DeFi, then ETH price is ETH price, the price of ETH vulnerable. Yeah, of course. Um, but again, that, that's a good thing, right? Not all of our holdings aren't in crypto. They're not all in ETH, hopefully. And so being able to accumulate in a bear market is, is a good thing because we believe in the future here and we, we want to hold these tokens long term, 10, 20 years. ETH dumping. I'll check that out. <laughs> That'd be interesting. I mean, it's again, it's a good thing. Hopefully you'll cash on the sidelines. It looks, I mean, it's it's down slightly at 2,900, but nothing crazy. Um, let's see. How do I think about diversifying my ETH position? So someone in our Discord community has a great comment here on this, which I don't know if I agree with completely, but it's interesting. And he basically told me, he said like, if you believe in this kind of meme or cute phrase of a multi-chain world, then you're kind of betting against technology because for a multi-chain world to really exist and flourish, it means that one chain can't scale to kind of be like the master chain and settlement layer. And from all of the research I've done, and I can share articles, rollups and data, sh data sharding are the best way to scale. There's a lot of info out there, Solana, like they're only scaling because of the high, they can only maintain this network because of the high inflation rate of the sole token to pay validators, but that's not sustainable. And the validators aren't getting compensated enough for the work and value they're putting into the system. So I do believe that ETH is the best way to scale. And as far as other smart contract platforms, I don't have uh, 
I don't really share my positions, but I don't really have anything sizable aside from ETH. I'll just say that. Do we buy the ETH dip or wait? So, I mean, you don't, not financial advice, but you never go all in. Um, if you think ETH is undervalued now, if you believe the bull market's not over, then sure, buy some. If you're like me, I take a 10, 20 year time horizon on this. And my thought process is like, ETH is trading about $3,000 right now. That's not going to be the high, right? ETH is not going to never reach $3,000 again. So for me, it doesn't really matter if I buy now, if I bought yesterday or tomorrow, if it goes down a few hundred dollars. Sure, you get more ETH for your money, but like I'm holding for 10, 20 years and I hope um, these small day-to-day decisions don't really matter then. It's just important that, you know, I was continually purchasing, etc. Future of Matic, pretty bearish on it. Uh, Matic is not a true L2 yet. It's a side chain. Um, we have Arbitrum and Optimism launching now, so I don't really see the value in Matic. Yes, they are working on a true roll-up solution with Hermes or Hermes. Um, so we'll see. They're a bit behind there, but um, yeah, I don't hold any now. I'm not super bullish on it. Also adjusted ones for later. Okay, so like a video topic on scams and NFTs and ERC-20s would be helpful. Yeah, I, I have a video on avoiding pump and dumps, which you guys can check out. Um, I think it called it like how to spot and avoid DeFi pump and dumps. Uh, so I think there's some good tips there, but perhaps I could do one for NFTs as well. I think that's a great idea. So thank you. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question. We hear a lot of arguments about governments needing to embrace DeFi, um, but why would they do that if they're going to lose control? Well, that's a great point, right? So we'll see. I mean, I think it's more just that there's free market competition. If we build, if the next Uniswap is built in, let's just say, Spain, like that's not good for the U.S. The U.S. customers will still be using it, but all of that valor, value and taxable income to the team that built it and you know, when they're selling their tokens, realizing capital gain, that value is gone. So if it's going to be built either way, you want it built in the U.S., even if it takes power from you. Most of these projects are clearly defined as securities. Yeah, I'm, I'm open about that. That's probably true. Do I feel crypto lobbying is poorly organized and incoherent? I'm not an expert there. I think everyone's doing the best they can right now. I don't think, you know, like I think it's still so early that we don't have good lobbying organizations, but I think the people I've seen on Twitter that are like working with Congress are pretty passionate and doing a good job. AVAX, um, I'm not, you know, short term, I'm sure AVAX will probably go up. I don't hold it anymore. I've sold it recently, um, but I don't see the need for AVAX when you have Ethereum. It doesn't really do anything unique. I mean, there's some fun projects on there, but they're just copy paste projects basically. And AVEX already needs a scaling solution. So I'm sure with these incentives, it'll probably go up in price. But like, do I think AVEX is going to be your avalanche will be here in 10 years? Probably not. So for me, that's how I judge investments. Like, do I believe it will be here in 10 years? If yes, okay, maybe buy it. If not, I don't see the point in speculating. Uh, let's see. OMG, that's an interesting pick. So yeah, OMG just launched on mainnet a layer two scaling solution for Ethereum. Uh, built off of Optimism. So they have a fully diluted token supply that's going to convert to the Boba token, which is kind of the new brand for the company, which is very interesting. Uh, I need to see how the OMG token converts to Boba. I think they're doing the conversion so that the Boba, the company behind Boba can have like part of the token supply because the OMG supply is fully diluted. So if this is kind of a way to reset the tokenomics and get tokens for the team and investors, that might not be a good thing, but I need to see that before I can know for sure. As far as the scaling solution, I think they have some cool features like instant settlement back to layer one as opposed to the one week challenge period on optimism, optimism and Arbitrum. So we'll see. Uh, yeah, someone asked for a video on OMG. So I'm actually planning that. I've been talking to the founder, or excuse me, the CEO of OMG or Boba right now. And uh, we're going to probably do like a live stream together next week or a video. So stay tuned for that and subscribe if you want to see that. Uh, let's see. When Brick made net launch as soon as possible. Like I said, we got the audits back. So we're making progress just fixing that. 
but big announcement soon, so stay tuned. Really excited for it. Gensler didn't touch on KYC. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think there's going to be KYC and off ramps. There's going to, I mean, that's, I think that that already exists, but it's going to be enforced even more. It's not going to be possible to take your funds off of the blockchain anonymously. Uh, so yeah, I do. I think KYC is going to be more prevalent. Um, I know, I think the infrastructure bill to actually pass something like that with transactions over $10,000 or something. So there's going to be more KYC, more need for privacy solutions like Tornado. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people from poker joined are now in DeFi yield farming and such. And I, I hear this a lot too, um, but I wasn't big in the online poker scene, so I don't really know. What do I think of the Rocket Pool token? So I love what Rocket Pool is building. I, you know, as far as their token goes, we'll see. Like it, it's, you know, it's going to be very volatile. It's going to be much riskier than holding ETH. Um, I don't know the tokenomics behind it. I've been thinking of doing a video so I can look more into it uh, later. Let's see. Oh, shit. Someone gave me a super chat. I didn't even know that was possible. Thanks, Jeremiah. That's really nice of you. Um, <laughs> so Filippo said, I didn't realize a 30-minute live stream would turn into a 24-hour live marathon. Props to him for trying to never let us down. I just want to answer all of the questions I can. I have fun doing it. If there's anything I can help with, that you know i know a little bit about i want to share it so thank you for that um doing what i can rocket pool first lido so i'm not talking about the token here but from a project perspective rocket pool is decentralized so i'm a fan of that i know lido is trying to be decentralized but they're not yet so more of a fan of rocket pool there i've been talking with the stakewise team they have an interesting project and if you stay in a little alpha leak they have a 20 percent apr on staking eth right now because of the stakewise token incentive so Definitely check that out. I think the website is just like, if you just Google stakewise, it'll pop up, but planning a video on that. So the yields might dilute, but right now they're, I think best in class for ETH. So if you stuck around, hopefully that helps a little. Thoughts on Phantom. Yeah, pretty centralized. Um, we'll see. I, I don't hold Phantom. I played around with the ecosystem. I have a video review of the ecosystem and what's available today if you want to check it out. Um, there's some notable DeFi people like Andre supporting it. So we'll see what happens. Um, but right now, I don't see much of a long-term you know, use case for it. So I don't think it's a long-term investment for me personally, but not financial advice. Hmm. Tokenized digital identity, Filippo says. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I haven't heard of that. I think it's it's so easy to track wallets to name. So we'll see, you know. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, I haven't heard of that. That's interesting. I would love to learn more. So if you're in the Discord, send me some information on that because I have to read up on that. A string of liquidations occurred. That is would be cool. If, hopefully none of you guys got liquidated, but that would be very interesting if it happened. Um, just seeing if there's anything happening. Yeah, it looks like, I mean, I think the market is probably mostly retail being nervous about what's happening. I don't think any institutions are changing course here because the drops are so low that I'm seeing. Uh, but if we get a cascading liquidation event, that would be very interesting. We'll see what price ETH drops to. Okay, so this question comes up a lot for the for people in Tornado. Like I mentioned, I'm part of the community there. Um, as far as I know, I've never heard of an instance of this happening. I've heard rumors of it happening, but there's no confirmations. Uh, Tornado does kind of have a plan to get around that if they had to. They could just spray Tornado funds to the top 1,000 wallets. And then everyone would have a connection to a tornado. So because these tokens are fungible, like all ETH is this, one ETH is the same as your ETH, my ETH is your ETH, et cetera. It's all fungible. They're all worth the same. They're all the same. No identity attached to them. Like if you were a friend of mine and you sent me one ETH, but you tornadoed it, well, do I not get that value now? Like what if you paid me to, I don't know, make a private video for you, right? Like if you paid me five ETH to do that and you use tornado because you didn't want to, you know, dox your main wallet, well, should I not get that value then? So I don't think Tornado is something that can be, some enforcements against that can really work. And Tornado is fully decentralized, so. Thoughts on Luna? Like, there's a large community. I'm sure the price is probably going to go up, but I'm not too bullish on it personally. Um, yeah, I, I just don't like the UST stablecoin and how the marketing is done behind that. It's not 
a true algorithmic stablecoin and it's not decentralized. Um, but I do think some of the products are cool, like giving people a 20% yield, not sustainable. It's temporary. It sucks for the anchor token, like, but it's cool for users. Like you get 20% for doing no work. So that's cool. I'm happy users have the option. And I do like Mirror. I think that's a compelling product project. I know it's controversial, but it's a, it's a good one. Strategy of Lido Curve is still a safe option. Yeah, I mean, they, this is their probably top power is probably talking about that ETH staking solution. This is the most popular way to do it. You stake ETH on Yearn or through Curve or Convex and you get like an 8%, 9% yield there. I do think it's a safe option. Um, I really like Element Finance now, which I have a video on, which gives you a fixed yield so you can lock in that 9% and guarantee it for a set period of time. So definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, it, I think it is a safe option. I mean, don't trust cats. I mean, they get into mischief. I wouldn't trust your cat to protect your hardware wallet. <laughs> have it backed up somewhere. Uh, favorite L1 besides ETH? That's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about that. I mean, I guess Bitcoin. Uh, I think Bitcoin's always going to have a place here. I have nothing against Bitcoin. I think right now ETH has more upside, so that's what I hold. But I have nothing against nothing against BTC. Again, you know, I talked about this. You can rewind if you want to hear my full thoughts. But they can go after the people, but not the project. Tornado is decentralized. It lives on the blockchain. Users will always be able to use Tornado. But if the team is in the US, those team members are, you know, vulnerable. Free alpha. This doesn't, man doesn't stop. I try. I try. Um, tornado, yeah, they need to, there's just no need to spray the funds yet. Like, I, I'm in favor of it. But to spray 0.1 ETH or 0.01 ETH to the top 1,000 mods, it costs some money. Um, if you want to message me offline, I can propose a governance vote for this and probably get support for it. Um, we'd basically convert funds from the Tornado Treasury into ETH if the community voted for that, and it, it can be done. So um, send me a, a DM if you want want to work on a proposal together. Did Gary speak yet? Yeah, please rewind. He spoke already. Now I'm just kind of answering questions randomly as, as they come. So, um, And if you guys haven't yet, please subscribe. Uh, definitely helps me out, and I try to release helpful videos uh, whenever I can. Opinions on Olympus. I have a video planned for this. I haven't done a deep dive yet, but so many people ask me about it. So I'm going to give my honest take on it. And I know they launched some cool new features, so I will be sharing that uh, on the channel. Zero to Hero on blockchain tech. From an engineering perspective, I'm sure there's online courses. I'm not positive. From like a DeFi perspective, if you're just trying to learn DeFi, you just have to play around, uh, subscribe to different YouTube channels. Um, I love Anthony Sassano. I watch his 30-minute podcast every morning. It gives you a full rundown of everything you need to know about ETH, um, and it's a great place to start. So, And everything is linked to, so if you want to go down a rabbit hole, you can. Justin <laughs> I'll make a private video for you for one ETH. <laughs> it depends what it's about. Uh, available for private lessons. I only do consulting really with institutions at this point, uh, but you can send me a DM on Discord. I'm usually like pretty available to help folks on an individual basis just, just for fun. So send me a DM in the, in the Discord or tag me in something and, and I'll see what I can do. Uh... A lot of questions about Phantom and AVEX, which I covered. Again, I'm not too bullish on them long term. Thoughts on BSC. Not a fan of BSC. I obviously have used it. Uh, very centralized. I, I don't really like what Binance is doing. I don't I don't like Binance as a company. Um, so I, I don't use Binance. I don't see any need to use it at this point. There's not anything innovative happening. But yeah, I'm sure there's great yield opportunities there. Uh wouldn't they receive all? Yes, but that is possible, right? But we could also spray like a random amount of ETH to, or ETH USDC die to tons of different addresses. So yeah, my hunch is it's not possible to enforce. Again, like uh, Mark, if, if I wanted to pay you one ETH for something and I, I just wanted to tornado the ETH because I didn't want you to see my full wallet. I didn't want you to know my investments to see how much money I had on chain, et cetera. Like that's a reasonable use case for chain and tornado. So 
I don't see how it, you can really make a case against it. But you never know. They might try. Thanks for the wonderful interactive content subbed on all platforms. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And everyone, I, I do now work with Nansen, so I want to give them a shout out. I just announced that partnered with Nansen to help deliver more data analytics insights on the Discord and also on YouTube videos. So in future live streams, you know, hopefully I'll be doing office hours with the Nansen team going over the project. Uh, whenever I review a project on YouTube, I hope to, you know, do an analytical deep dive into the tokenomics, who's holding it, who's selling it, et cetera, what our insider is doing. So I think that's going to be really helpful. And um, yeah, so if any has questions about that, let me know. Uh, Anthony Sassano's podcast, How Do You Write It, Please? Uh, that's how you spell his name. But if you search The Daily Way on YouTube, it'll pop up. I think he, he's a pretty popular channel. And if you look on his Twitter, you'll get all the links you need to. He's awesome. Which roll-ups are you most bullish on? Hard to say right now. Obviously, Arbitrum is stealing the show. I think Optimism, when they fully launch, they're going to have give Arbitrum a run for their money, and it's going to be a war for incentives. So I'll be curious to see. And obviously, we have OMG, Boba Network coming out. <laughs> I do have a traditional savings account, of course, yes. Um, <laughs> just gotta, you need to do it to pay for things. Um, Oh, wow, this is so nice of you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy if I can help in any way. So I really appreciate the kind words. Um, and yes, this is how you spell Anthony Sasano's name. Just type in the Daily Gway. Um, cool. I don't see any more questions. Um, yeah, I've been going for a little over an hour and a half, so I'll probably end it here. Thank you all so much for watching. This was like one of my most watched live streams. And thank you all so much for staying so long as you did. Hopefully you learned something and it was helpful. Uh, if you liked the video, please like it, subscribe if you haven't yet. And I really want to thank you all. And yes, this is the link to the Daily Gway. Um, so thank you all so much for watching. I will see you guys soon. I'm trying to put out a video today or tomorrow at the latest. So you'll have more from me soon. And please come join us in the Discord. There's a lot of great people there.